Good morning. Uh, it's good to see you this, this morning. There is um, a lot of stuff to go through this morning, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. I'm going to pray, and uh, we'll dive in. God, thanks for today. God, thanks for just such a beautiful day. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we are definitely blessed to be here, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to gather as brothers and sisters to, to continue to go through and to try to, to understand and, and, and press into these ideas of um, the doctrine of the lesser magistrates and understanding God just biblically what, what you call us to in our role as um, citizens of this country. Lord, we need wisdom. We need discernment. We need you to um, give us an understanding. And uh, Lord, we ask that you would uh, use this time this morning to help us in that way. And Lord, I do pray for your spirit to come to guide and lead our time. And God, I do pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> So we are, um, we are going through this book, The Doctrine of the Lesser Magistrates, uh, kind of um, taking several chapters and kind of lumping them all together and summarizing some of these concepts and some of these thoughts. Um, um, again, it's more of a primer. Uh, it's really just to kind of get people uh, whetted their appetites so that you look into this more and you dig into it a little bit more. So uh, at times, he can be a little bit repetitive in some of the things he says. Uh, we are going to spend the bulk of our time, though, uh, going through um, a lot of what Glenn Sunshine unpacks in his book called Slaying Leviathan, Limited Government and Resistance in the Christian Tradition. So uh, we're going to be going through both, but uh, highly encourage you to look at getting in this. Uh, very, very helpful, very beneficial in, in walking you through historically um, how we got to how we are here in this country right now. So uh, I'm going to do my best to try to summarize that, um, but I really have no idea how that's going to go. I have nine pages of notes, so we're just going to jump right in and, and go. Before we start, uh, we're going to kind of start in and just, uh, again, kind of refresh some stuff um, from Matt Truella's book. We're going to be looking at chapters 4, 5, and 6 this morning. Uh, and he talks about this idea of duty. And he, um, he makes the statement that in our day and age, we've kind of lost the sense of duty. And what does that mean? And so he defines it in this way, that which a person owes to another or by which a person is bound to another by any natural, moral, or lawful obligation to perform. Duty is an action required by one's position or by moral and lawful considerations. Um, so in our day and age, we've kind of lost this sense of, of duty. We, we have a duty to, to one another. Do lesser magistrates have a duty and obligation? You know, uh, in the military, we had, to, we had to take an oath, right? Um, and part of that was to um, uphold the Constitution of the United, United States, um, you know, policemen, all these positions have an oath that they take to say, this is what I'm going to commit to, and this is my obligation, this is my duty. And so um, I think he just wants to bring a, rem a reminder that, you know, there, with authority comes a position of, comes a, a sense of duty. Like you have a, a responsibility to the people that are under your authority. Uh, and again, magistrate is this idea of a person clothed with power as a public civil officer, something that we've been talking about. It's just an, an older term talking about somebody that has a position of authority. And he says, in the context of our country, the duty of the lesser magistrate regarding the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, what we've been talking about, um, this idea that you know, the lesser magistrate is in a position to um, stand against if a higher authority um, decides to make unjust laws. And so he, he breaks this down into three, three ideas specific to our country here in the United States. He says the first one, their duty is to oppose and resist any laws or edict from the higher authority that contravene the law or word of God. Secondly, he says they are to protect the person, liberty, and property of those who reside within their jurisdiction from any unjust or immoral laws or actions by the higher authority. And then thirdly, they are not to implement any laws or decrees made by the higher authority that violate the Constitution and, if necessary, resist them. So again, these ideas that we've been talking about. So this idea of duty, 
Um, the magistrate is not to just um, unquestioningly do whatever they're told as it comes down from higher above. We've, we've talked about this a lot, that there's, a, there's an absolute authority, and that's God. Um, and his law is the absolute basis of why we do what we do. And so if those things contravene those things, then the lesser magistrate has a duty to resist those things. Um, one of the things that Truella talks about is, you know, our government was made with multi-levels uh, for the purpose because our founders understood original sin, something that we'll talk about a little bit later this morning, and they had a skepticism uh, towards government, and they knew that it that that men would want to crave power, and so they they created this multi-level uh, system to try to resist the corruption coming. Unfortunately, in our day and age, we can see where the federal government has bought off the lower magistrates in a sense. You know, federal government money comes and the states or whoever takes it, uh, they are now in a compromised p position to say, well, how can you stand against the federal government because you've accepted this money? And so that creates somewhat of a problem here. Um, they've been bought off to do the federal government's bidding, which is which is not a good thing, and uh, something that we need to be aware of in regards to our support of lesser magistrates and encouraging them to do the right thing. Uh, and then he goes on in, in this chapter four, and he talks about why it's wise and proper for resistance to come from the lesser magistrate. Um, and he lists quite a few things. I'm just going to talk ab ab about a couple of them. Um, this morning, just for the sake of time, um, there's a, a list of like nine or ten of these. But he makes the statement that it's it's appropriate and wise because the lesser magistrate already possesses a lawful, God-given authority, which they may invoke. They're already in a position of authority. They have been supported by many in the successful bid to achieve office. Therefore, they have an established power base of popular support already in place. <clears throat> lesser magistrates usually have constitutional precedent and law on their side so that there is some form of heritage or history which, to which they can appeal. They already have access to public forums which they can articulate the particulars of the grievance that is involved. Uh, by virtue of their office, they're able to address the pangs of conscience and doubt and indecision of the people when they see tyranny developing in their nation and they see the need for resistance uh, this idea ultimately that they they are uh, ultimately in a place where they can rally the people to respond to honorable, authoritative leadership. Uh, also, when lesser magistrates stand up, there's a sense that it strikes terror into the hearts of those above that are trying to bring about oppression and tyranny uh, because it flushes them out into the open of recognizing that, hey, there's people that are here willing to stand against what I'm doing. And uh, there's a there's a certain sense of caution, not always, but because of their position, they do have that. So um, kind of with that in mind, I want to depart this morning from um, from going through this and talking about uh, this book, Slaying Leviathan from Glen Sunshine. Uh, the reason why I want to do that is because part of what Matt Truella talks about is this idea of the rule of law. And I think it's important to kind of take a uh, I guess what I'm going to do here is a, a, a survey of history to see uh, how we got to where we are today. Um, and I think that's important because I think it helps us understand the context of, of our country and how it was founded and that it was really founded on um, a lot of Christian heritage, a lot of people that gave their lives or had to run out of fear because of what they stood for and understood the Bible to teach throughout history. Uh, really is uh, amazing. So I'm um, going to spend the bulk of the time, really uh, the information that we're going through really comes out of this book, um, Slaying Leviathan. Again, I encourage you to read that. want to start this morning with Matthew 22, 21, Jesus' words <clears throat> saying, Therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Uh, and in this statement, um, Jesus established that there's a, there, there's a finite limit to what the government can do. Uh, but I think in that uh, begins this process of trying to understand where, where is that limit. Uh, we will see throughout history that uh, 
Uh, people draw different lines on that limit, but um, the government does not have ultimate authority, and uh, Jesus establishes that as in this passage in Matthew 22. So we're going to take a, we're going to first look at um, Augustine and his work, The City of God. It was written around 410 A.D. Uh, and according to Sunshine, it's one of the most influential books in history and is responsible for shaping how the Western world thought of itself for well over a thousand years. Um, in this book, The City of God is, kinda, in a sense, it's, called, it's a tale of two cities. One is the city of man. One is the city of God. The city of man is uh, ruled and governed, uh, if you will, uh, focused on self-love and self-indulgence. <clears throat> And the city of God is love of God and love of neighbor. So in a sense, only Christians were part of this city of God, uh, those receiving the grace of Christ being brought in. Um, <clears throat> so he makes this distinction. He says, both cities have an interest in promoting good behavior, but for very different purposes and by very different means. The sunshine says, Augustine's effort to find common ground between the city of God and the city of man provided an important theological justification for Christians to be involved in civil government. By promoting true goodness and virtue as a civil magistrate, the Christians can, in fact, work to advance the interests of both cities simultaneously. <clears throat> Augustine believed in original sin, which in, in influenced his view of government. And in a sense, um, Augustine has a very pessimistic view of government because of this reason. Uh, he's very wary. Uh, very cautious that that was an influencer on the founding fathers however in his beliefs he believed that the state still had a right and a responsibility to coerce heretics to rejoin the church which is a very interesting very interesting thing actually it's a very unfortunate thing because his thoughts influenced um church and state practices i guess for many hundreds of years and so he didn't believe that was the the case that the state had the ability to force um, non-believers, so that didn't impact Gentiles or Jews, if you will. But for for heretics, he believed that the the the, the church could use the force of the state to compel them to rejoin the church, um, and that set up really an unhealthy, unbiblical cooperation of church and state for for many hundreds of years. Uh, it resulted in uh, persecution and in coercion of religious dissenters, which, you know, as we've talked about in these spheres of authority, um, the church and the state have different roles and responsibilities, and there is some overlap, but the church should not rely on the power, the coercion of the state to force its beliefs and to persecute and put people to death. So, um, you know, we benefit greatly from from the thoughts and, and concepts and, and doctrinal beliefs of Augustine, but he still didn't get everything right. I think that's one of the things I guess I want you to keep in mind as we go through these things that these were very um, mature, very biblical men that were trying to do what's right. And um, yet in that sense, God used them to impact and affect history. Uh, we're going to turn to Aristotle, which I know is funny because he was B.C., but um, in the kind of the 1200s, Thomas Aquinas had requested the translation of Aristotle's politics to be translated into Latin. This is around 1260 A.D. Aristotle um, <coughs> and his writings, this writing was very critically important to the founding fathers and his understanding of government. Uh, Aristotle had a more positive view of government than um, Augustine did. Uh, he still was cautious and wary because I think he understood the nature that corruption can come, but he still had a more positive view. Uh, Sunshine says, Aristotle's political theory is based on natural law. Uh, natural law being this, this idea that um, God has established right and wrong in the hearts of men. Um, that is who we are by nature. So this, this idea of natural law is just, it exists in all people. Uh, I don't know that Aristotle would have said that it comes from God, but that's what we believe, this idea of natural law. He argued that the nature of anything is determined by its purpose, or as he put it, its final cause. For humanity, our end is happiness, or this uh, idea, or the Greek word eudaimonia. Very different concept than what we would 
understand happiness to be, and we will unpack that a little bit later. Um, <clears throat> for humanity, our end is happiness, which he understood to be the full development of all our natural abilities pursued through reason. This leads to a life of virtue and excellence. So from Aristotle's perspective, he understood that government was in place to help the community flourish, kind of more of a positive idea that rather than government was in a place to kind of squelch um, and punish the evil, which that is part of its role. But he, he came about it from a different perspective. <clears throat> Promote the good and encourage citizens toward a life of virtue. Uh, one of his main topics in politics was to understand how best to structure the state to promote its proper end. And he came up with three basic forms of government. <clears throat> Again, Aristotle knew that there was um, not always a tendency towards the good and that government can be corrupt. So he had a, he had a balance there. He wasn't just uh, everything's great and government's just there to promote, to promote the good. But he understood it in this way. The three basic forms are uh, rule by a single individual which in its uh, good form is called monarchy, yet when ruled in self-interest rather than for the common good, it becomes tyranny. Rule by a few, when it's for the common good, is called aristocracy, yet when the, f when the few rule out of self-interest rather than the common good, it becomes an oligarchy. And then rule by the many <coughs> is called a republic, rule by representation. However, in its degenerate form, it's called democracy, which is fascinating because I think there's a lot of misconception that that is what we have is democracy, but we have a republic. Um, and democracy literally means mob rule, where citizens make all the decisions directly. Democracy is a rule by passion rather than reason. If we go back to what Aristotle said, is this understanding of the full development of our natural ability abilities pursued through reason, not passion. So uh, when we are led by passion, it becomes mob rule and a degenerate form of representation. Um, <clears throat> these are very influential concepts on our founding fathers, as we'll see a little bit later this morning. Um, I'm going to briefly highlight some other things um, because I'm fearful that I'm not going to have time. Um, I want to also talk about the Middle Ages and this idea of uh, re evolving ideas about rights and liberties, uh, which was important. Uh, I think in order to do that, we need to understand um, this Greek word called eos, sorry, Latin word called eos. Um, so theologians and canonists, kind of the Catholic, um, the Catholics that were uh, studied and understood the law of God uh, is what those they continued to develop a sense of rights in the Middle Ages. Um, and it's this understanding of eos is the, is the Latin root word for justice and jurisprudence. So jurisprudence being the science or philosophy of law. So eos in its basic meaning is law, but it's really regarding the abstract or the universal law. Um, so it versus... Um, the Latin word lex, which is the actual written statutes. Does that make sense? So we're talking about a, a abstract universal concept of uh, law versus like actually written down statutes, which is lex. So both of those ideas had meaning. Uh, and in, in, in the early days, the Stoics believed that the cosmos were governed by eos, this abstract universal law. Universal law and principles of reason that were binding on all people and which gave people certain rights and responsibilities. This was kind of part of the development of this idea of understanding unalienable rights. Uh, where do they come from? How do we understand them? Uh, which we'll see as we go farther. Um, this idea of uh, life, because it was given to us by God, is deemed as a universal, unalienable right because it's given by God. It's not given to us by governments. But now, there's, as we'll see as we go throughout history, there, some of the other unalienable rights are somewhat uh, controversial, I guess, debated uh, whether or not these are actually really unalienable rights. Um, but in this concept, rights was closely connected with the idea of liberty. So they're developing these things. And Sunshine says, the original term originally referred to a zone of freedom of action, talking about liberty. So it originally referred to a zone of freedom of action within the boundaries of law, both eos and lex. Anything that is neither required nor prohibited by law, we are free either to do 
or not to do according to our own choices and decisions. They were developing this idea that liberty is thus a right as well, since it exists within the framework of eos. So, uh, in the Middle Ages, kind of this idea of developing these thoughts of what are what are our freedoms, what are our unalienable rights, trying to try to process through these. In the same time frame, we have the Magna Carta, um, which is another significant document of of our of our history and what the founding fathers used. Um, just very briefly, this was uh, King John was a tyrannical ruler. Uh, he was a not a good king. Um, he lost a lot of properties in wars, and to try to recoup and recover those things, he began to tax his people in ridiculous ways. Um, there's an idea that th in this time was called scuttage, um, if that's the right way you say it, but basically these nobles could pay him a certain amount of money and not have to serve in his military. There was this idea of, of fees that he was allowed to use for people getting married, for people doing different things, and uh, it's purported that he charged one of the nobles or barons something like 13,000 pounds to just to get married, which is the equivalent of about $17 million today. So, I mean, he was just, he was just an unjust, not good king. And the, the nobles of the time said enough is enough. Um, you can't just do whatever you want. And they stood against King John, ultimately uh, forcing him to put his seal on the Magna Carta. Uh, but the way that Sunshine talks about this, he says that the Magna Carta included protection for liberties of the church and the city of London as corporate entities. But it also provided protections for the barons individually and collectively of free men and even serfs, which was a huge, this was a huge uh, deal in our in history um, because it guaranteed a number of liberties rooted in the law of the kingdom versus uh, liberties, natural liberties, like what we were talking about just before. So there's a difference here. So the Magna Carta wasn't necessarily used to say we have certain unalienable rights, but it did say we have certain rights that we can appeal to and that the king needs to be under law. He needs to follow the law. He's not above the law. Uh, so very important developments in history there. Uh, Sunshine then goes into the Reformation, some of what we've already talked about with Martin Luther. So we'll briefly just highlight some of those things. I think it's important to dive into and understand a little bit more of the context and their idea of the uses. They had two ideas uh, of uses for the law. Um, law meaning um, civil law as well as biblical law. They understood that, that they needed both, that both were important. Uh, the first use was it restrained people from acts of evil through fear of punishment. Uh, this They used biblical and civil law for this use. And then the second being biblical law shows us our guilt and drives us to the gospel, uh, something that we understand from Romans 3, right? The, the law is not bad. It is good, but it's not meant to save. Uh, the law is meant to reveal our sinfulness and drive us to our, our need of salvation in Jesus Christ. So uh, this was their understanding of the second use of the law. Later reformers after Luther kind of developed a third sense of the law, which came out of the second sense. Really, they, they saw it as a guide to right behavior for Christians. So uh, if, if we claim to be converted, if we claim to be born-again believers, then there should be a fruit to our lives. There should be something that is manifest, that, that is seen, um, teaches us the good works that should emerge from our faith. So um, <clears throat> this, is, this intended function of the law that they developed here is, um, is an important function of our law today. People often associate what is legal with what is moral. I think we can see that in our, our day and age today. Our, I mean, we've got some pretty crazy laws, and they're trying to move even farther away from biblical truth. But uh, as, as we make these things legal, people go ahead and, and pursue and do those things. Now, um, it's not this idea that we feel like um, the be-all and end-all is if we have moral laws that everything's good. But there is a restraint that comes with having uh, moral laws. It restrains the majority of the people to say, okay, this is illegal, that's bad. That's kind of the point. Uh, in this era, Luther uh, was impacted by Augustine's The City of God, and he wrote himself a two-kingdom doctrine, 
very similar to Augustine's, but a little bit different in certain aspects. Uh, in this two-kingdom doctrine, he understood it to be a right-hand kingdom and a left-hand kingdom. The right-hand kingdom, similar to the city of God, uh, where it's, it's kind of this kingdom of, of Christians, uh, it grows out of the second use of the law, the idea that the law shows us our guilt and drives us to the gospel. Uh, there's no need for coercion in this because as people are um, brought into the faith, their desire is to obey God uh, freely and naturally because of the fruit of the Spirit. The left-hand kingdom was different than Augustine's city of man. Uh, in Augustine's city of man, it re represents a world in rebellion to God, uh, but in, in Luther's left-hand kingdom, um, it was the idea that it operates under divine authority to promote, to promote God's purpose in society by fulfilling the first use of the law and restrained by force if necessary. So that is a lot of what we saw when we were going through Romans 13 and 1 Peter 2, this idea that the government's established role biblically is to punish evil and reward good. Right, So Luther, in this, this idea of the left-hand kingdom, understand, understood this concept um, and, and that, that <coughs> they operate, the government operates under divine authority to mo promote his purposes, um, and that's to punish evil and to reward good. However, in, in the Reformation, still true religious liberty would not, would not come. Uh, as, we, as we talked about, Augustine kind of uh, created in his thoughts and ideas this unhealthy combination of church and state. And, um, you know, Luther helped to develop some of that, but there was still an unhealthy partnership between church and state. And uh, Sunshine talks about in, a, in the early church, they understood the separation of church and state because of the per persecution of the Roman Empire. Uh, however, in the Middle Ages, the Pope decided to come in and say, I've got authority over all Christians, established his own form of government that kind of worked in tandem, parallel. Uh, they worked kind of hand in hand. And so now in the Reformation, we've got this idea that now, now we've got a separation once again. So how are we going to navigate through that? Um, what they came up with was called state churches. Uh, but so ultimately, the state still had a hand in, in, ch in churches, which... And ultimately, we won't see until, until later. Uh, again, I think it's important to just understand that these guys lived in a historical context. They understood truth, but they're still kind of influenced by what is going on in their lives. So uh, I think that's one of the things that I've uh, really grown in appreciation for in reading this book is this idea of um, how important that is and how it impacts and um, how significant of time that it takes for history to kind of, for, for men to work through history, for God to work through men in history to bring us to this point, if that makes any sense. Um, at this point, we see Calvin enter into the picture. Uh, he believed that church and state institutions were ordained by God and they had specific responsibilities and that neither should interfere with the other. Interesting, interestingly enough, um, he still promoted a connection with the two. Um, Fascinating that he understood these were institutions ordained by God with specific responsibilities and neither should interfere. But he was still, in the context of that history, promoted the connection. Um, we also see during that time uh, this idea of voluntaristic churches. This was kind of promoted by Conrad Grable and the Anabaptists. Uh, ultimately, this idea was that you aren't born into the church uh, you aren't born into the church because of who your family is, but uh, this is an idea that you become part of the church because this is what God has done in you. Um, you know, we can talk about, we talked about a little bit of the Anabaptists, um, and the, but ultimately they believed that uh, you needed to be bap believer's baptism is what they believed. So uh, in, in kind of the Calvinist Reformed idea, you were just part of the church. If you were born into the church, you were baptized as a baby and you were just, you were just part of that system. Um, the Anabaptists started developing this idea of being voluntaristic. And ultimately, the focus was a fruit of a person's ongoing life uh, that mattered. <coughs> I think a, a helpful kind of way to kind of um, maybe understand these, 
uh, a couple of concepts. Sunshine uh, talks about uh, theologian and historian George Hunston Williams uh, and his distinguishing of the two main branches of the Protestant Reformation. He called them mainstream reformers and radical reformers. Uh, he put the mainstream reformers as Luther and Calvin, and he called them magisterial as they still sought to work with the state and the church. Uh, and then the radical reformers being these Anabaptists, which had a sharp distinction between church and state. They didn't want the government to be involved in their churches. So uh, at this point, we're starting to see this, this separation here um, coming out of the Reformation, coming out of part of the Reformation. Um, Sunshine then goes kind of, he jumps a little bit into the 18th and 19th century, uh, and he talks about kind of the secularized state coming forward in this in in Luther's uh, two kingdom doctrine really becoming less and less tenable less and less able to maintain because in a secular state they just don't they don't value God and his truth and what he has to say and so they, they there's this there's this pull apart um, and at this point um, in history it gives rise to what was called uh, the transformational model uh, this is something that um, was brought about by Reformed theologians such as Abraham Kuyper um, in the late 19th century and H. Richard, I don't know how you say his name, uh, Nybar in the 20th century. And this idea of transformational is um, where the church works to transform society uh, and with it government into more godly forms. So kind of a very similar idea of what, what we're talking about. Right, we're we're pur purporting, and and part of this doctrine of the lesser magistrate is encouraging us to uh, to see transformation in our society by how we live, by preaching the gospel, by living all of life out uh, in worship of God, uh, and and being part of um, being part of the civil government. You know, looking for opportunities to to be engaged in society in this way. Sunshine says the implications of this, this idea of a transformational model moving from the two kingdom doctrine, is that if we believe that God's ways are the best for society, then out of love for our neighbor, we should work to put his ways into practice in our communities. This means cultural engagement, not simply as consumers or even critics, but as culture creators, bringing the values of the kingdom into the world around us. He goes on to say, <clears throat> that does, of course, also mean engagement with politics, whether by voting or lobbying or running for office. Even the American separation of church and state, we are not excused, even in the American church, uh, separation of church and state, we are not excused from seeking the good of our neighbor and our city where God has sent us. Uh, as I was reading th through that, I, uh, I thought of Jeremiah 29 um, in this idea uh, that... Israel has been um, <coughs> exiled, and false prophets were saying that within two years, uh, the yoke of Babylon is going to be broken and the exile is going to return home. And uh, <coughs> in Jeremiah 29, God is speaking through Jeremiah in verse 4. He says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease. But seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, declares the Lord. So in, this, in the same sense, we are, we are exiles. This is in our home, right? Uh, we, be, we belong to God, and he has placed us here. Uh, and so in the same way, we are, to, we are to seek the benefit of our city. We are to seek the benefit of the people around us, because in their benefit, we benefit. And so it's the same concept um, that they're talking about here uh, in this transformational model. Um, then we jump back into uh, looking at uh, Protestant, re Protestant resistance theory. Uh, I think 
another important area of understanding what happened in those times. We talked about that a, a little bit, um, so we won't hit that too hard. Uh, this was the idea of resistance by the lesser magistrate. Um, this is what the Protestant resistance theory supported. Um, there was three important works in there. I don't know that we need to necessarily uh, hit those. Really, one of them, uh, I'm not going to be able to say this right because it's in Latin, but I'll do my best. <coughs> uh, Vindicie contra Tyrannos. It was written under a pseudonym, uh, but in that work, it focused on the tension between obedience to God versus obedience to government. Uh, and this book was very influential on John Locke and John Adams. We will talk about John Locke a little bit later this morning. John Adams, obviously one of um, the founding fathers. And then uh, we're going to spend most more of our time talking about resistance theory in Britain. We talked a little bit about that. John Knox was part of that. Uh, but we're going to talk about some of the other players during that. Um, this was seen as a little bit more radical than Protestant resistance theory. Uh, some of the distinctions were that they believed that the private citizen had a right to revolt uh, against uh, tyr tyranny. So uh, definitely we'll see as we go through some of these things that um, their ideas were, were farther pushed um, in regards to resistance theory. Uh, John, uh, John, we'll look at John Poinet, John Poinet, John Poinet, I don't know how you say his name, Christopher Goodman, um, and then we're not going to really look at John Knox that much this morning. Um, John Poinet's uh, work uh, sh called A Short Treatise of Politic Power. Uh, this also, in addition to the Vindicie contra Tyrannos, was uh, a, a huge influencer on John Locke and John Adams. It explored questions of when a legitimate monarch turned into an illegitimate ty tyrant. However, uh, he went pretty far radical, and, and he put together our um, arguments for tyrannicide. So the point, the, the idea that ultimately we can revolt to the point of killing the tyrant. Um, very definitely more radical than Protestant resistance theory. Um, John Goodman and his work, <coughs> How Superior Powers Ought to Be Obeyed by Their Subjects, and Wherein They May Lawfully by God's Word Be Disobeyed and Resisted, Quite a long work, but uh, written in 1558. <coughs> Sunshine says, <coughs> Goodman's, treaty, uh, Goodman's treaties argued that although it would be best if resistance to tyranny were led by the lesser magistrates, if lower officials failed to take that responsibility, the common people could rise against the, the tyrant. <coughs> Further, Romans 13 only applies to legitimate kings who reward good and punish evil, as the text itself shows. It does not apply to tyrants who punish good and reward evil. In fact, since tyranny comes from Satan, to obey a tyrant is to rebel against God. Far from being a sin, resistance to tyranny is therefore an obligation in the sight of God. <coughs> Sunshine also points out that both of these points, uh, resistance by the people, if the lesser magistrate refused to act, and resistance to tyranny as a requirement before God, were ideas that were definitely more radical than the Protestant resistance theory as well. Uh, he says, except for the Anabaptists, they, they believed that these were our rights and responsibilities as well. Um, also during this time, uh, there was this idea of, um, from the two kingdom doctrine, the covenant view, uh, but also the divine right view started coming. Um, so the covenant view was supported by Poinet and Goodman, this was derived from uh, Reformed Calvinistic thought, which said, all authority derives from God, who delegates his authority to the people. They, in turn, delegate their authority to the king to execute true justice in line with God's will on behalf of the people. Versus divine right, this was an idea that royalists around Europe and some in Britain believed. This was an absolutist vision that ultimately said there can never be grounds for resisting royal authority. The king speaks for God, and if he gets it wrong, the people will be held guiltless if they sin by obeying him. <coughs> so drastically different views. Um, we will look at um, uh, one of the supporting works that had a huge influence. Um, Thomas Hobbes wrote a, a work, but um, in this, kind of as a, a resistance or a uh, 
a reaction to this idea of divine right came from Samuel Rutherford in his work, Lex Rex, or the Law and the Prince. Um, and in this, <clears throat> he argued that many legitimate forms of government, excuse me, he argued that there are many legitimate forms of government, but the authority is vested in the position, not the person. Therefore, it is possible to depose a king without undermining royal authority. He also taught that <clears throat> there needed to be a just cause to resist. Uh, you can't just resist because you don't like it. Uh, it has to be rooted in something, and he believed that it ought to be rooted in natural law. Um, he also believed that it was the duty of the preacher to explain carefully the moral case for or against resistance to the government. So the preacher's res duty, right, responsibility was to help the teacher, the, the people, understand what their responsibilities were. Um, and he also supported this idea that when resistance is justified, it's to be done by the lesser magistrate. So, you know, obviously these varying ideas during this time of whether or not the people had a right, whether it was appropriate to do it from the lesser magistrate, um, all these ideas are trying, are being formed in formulated and worked through and works being written. Um, we're going to focus now on Thomas Hobbes, who was a purporter of absolutism, which basically said, the king comes from God, therefore whatever he says goes, doesn't matter. Um, he wrote a, a work called Leviathan, or the matter, form and power of a commonwealth, ecclesiastical and civil. Uh, this was in 1651. According to Sunshine, this work pointed to a totalizing vision of the state that was not only made up of all the people under the king, but whose reach extended into every area of life, even religion and conscience. So a fairly significant view of what the king had the authority to do. Um, Hobbes also argued that resistance against a duly constituted government is never legitimate and that kings cannot become tyrants since nothing they do is subject to question. Uh, that's a pretty significant and serious statement, but it, it had impact on history. Um, his work was, was very influential. Uh, in this, what ultimately Hobbes did was he eliminated natural rights, so this idea of unalienable rights. There, there is no such thing in an absolutist government because whatever the king says goes. So you don't have a right to life, liberty. Uh, there are no natural rights. There are no mutual responsibilities between the sovereign and the people. This was called absolutism and the divine right of kings. Ultimately, what Hobbes taught was he rejected any role of God in polity and left the question of religion up to the sovereign. <clears throat> in this, Sunshine says it started an unstoppable trend to the secularizing of political theory. So, uh, you know, as we've seen up until kind of now, uh, the Bible, God's law, natural law, had a significant influence on how people understood what civil government was supposed to do. Uh, and in this, there starts to be a disconnect. It's kind of this bringing about of the secularization of, um, of governments. Ultimately, you know, we can do politically whatever with, irrespective to what God says and who God is or any of those kinds of things. So there's, there's starting to be a disconnect here. <coughs> Thankfully, uh, the Christian concepts of unalienable rights and resistance to tyranny continue to play a major role um, in the opponents of absolutism, uh, which kind of brings us into looking at John Locke. Uh, according to Sunshine, he was the most important political theorist in England during the 17th century. He was a Puritan, but after reading some biblical criticism of the day, he began to question the authority of Scripture, uh, yet his foundations in um, understanding truth impacted his life and what he understood and, and how he believed. Um, even though 
you know, I'm not sure at the end he was, would have, I don't know, you would have said that Locke was a, a Christian. He had foundations in that thought, and it did impact what he believed. He rejected the doctrine of original sin. Um, he believed an elaborate structure of government could be created that regulated every situation, and this would make corruption much less likely. So, uh, opposed to Augustine, who believed in original sin, was very skeptical and said, you know, man is sinful, and he will do everything in his power to, to corrupt, and we have to guard against that. Locke didn't believe in original sin, uh, and therefore he thought if you could write a long enough constitution that uh, understood every potential, then you could uh, minimize corruption because you've thought of everything. Um, definitely something that the founding fathers did not buy into, but this is something that impacted Locke and his works. Uh, this was a very different approach from the Founding Fathers. His most important work was the Two Treaties of Government, written in 1689. The first treaty was a rejection of absolutism, so kind of a rejection of what Thomas Hobbes was teaching, that the divine right of kings, that the kings can do whatever, uh, and they can't ever become tyrants because they've been put in place by God. So the first treaty was a rejection of that. <clears throat> the second treaty was an elaboration on the proper principles for establishing government. Uh, Locke believed in um, divine and natural law, uh, according to Sunshine, that even without government, people were still subject to divine and natural law and that people had the right to judge and punish breaches of those laws. In other words, people had liberty in the old sense, kind of what we talked about in the Middle Ages, freedom to act as they wished within the boundaries set by God's law and natural law. No one had a right to tell anyone what to do within those boundaries, but neither did anyone have freedom to transgress those boundaries and violate the law. So uh, Locke br brings back this idea of uh, natural and divine law and this understanding of rights. <coughs> Echoes very similarly to the thoughts of the medieval theo uh, theologian and canonists when we discussed about uh, laws, uh, sorry, divine uh, Natural rights in the middle, medieval ages. Locke understood this and developed this into uh, natural rights being um, unalienable rights to include life, liberty, in a state, what we would call property. Um, he believed that um, unalienable rights go back to what the Stoics taught, um, this was given to us by God. Uh, the idea of liberty followed the same Christian theologians uh, to reason that it was given by God. And then property, he reasoned that when we put part of ourselves into labor, it is part of us and we have a right to own what we produce. Uh, this is called the labor theory of property. Uh, John Locke didn't really use this, but we can see that in Genesis 2. God gave Adam to work the garden and to enjoy the produce, the fruits of his labor. So uh, Locke used that to understand this idea that property was a right, uh, a state, if you want to call it. Uh, ultimately, what Locke did in his, um, in his works is he unified a lot of these concepts that we're talking about. He took, um, he took a lot of multiple elements of legal and political theory in, and brought it into a single coherent philosophy of government. So he brought in the natural rights from the medieval theologians. He brought in this idea of limited government from Augustine, even though Augustine understood that limited government needed to be because of sinful man. Locke didn't believe that, but he still believed in this idea of limited government. And then he further developed the ideas of Protestant resistant theory. So this idea that, uh, you know, Kings needed to be subject to, to the law, to the rule of law, and they couldn't just do whatever they want, and there was a, a, a justification for the people to rise up against that. <clears throat> the roots of his thought are firmly within the Christ Christian tradition. Um, interesting to, to note that he was, uh, his, his work was written to address the situation in England currently, but it was ultimately had the most uh, important as, uh, impact on our founding fathers and how they understood um, and ultimately Thomas Jefferson in his writing of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, this takes us into kind of um, looking lastly at um, 
the founding fathers. <clears throat> In order to understand that, I think we under, need to understand what was kind of happening during that time, uh, this idea of the Great Awakening. Sorry, my mouth is super dry. <clears throat> um, the Great Awakening ultimately started with what was called the Evangelical Revival that was happening in Britain. Uh, this was seen in the Methodist revivals in its Calvinistic form led by George Whitfield and its, in its Arminian form led by the Wesleys. Uh, and out of that kind of led to the Great Awakening in the colonies. Uh, probably what's most familiar is Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the, in the Hands of an Angry God. Uh, it's really this focus on, on conversion uh, because in that period, during that time, uh, religion had become kind of a sure what the right, the best word for it is. Um, almost like a, like a community, uh, like a, a, a club kind of a thing. This is what you did. You got married in the church. You had babies in the church. Uh, you, got di- you died in the church. But it really had no impact on how you lived. <clears throat> you were just part of the church in some abstract form. And so this great awakening brought out this sense of the, the understanding that we are sinners in need of grace. And um, this idea of focus on conversion on conversion <clears throat> uh, that was the biz- biggest impact politically was that emphasis on conversion uh, they understood and saw that God working directly was God God was working directly with the invi- individual uh, therefore they understood that a converted individual had as much authority in God's eyes as a king or a bishop uh, this reinforced some of the tendencies of the, of the British resistance theory uh, where private citizens, had the, uh, the right, I guess, if you will, to resist and not just the lesser magistrate. Uh, in this, it also focused on a passion for liberty. Uh, their thought was as born-again and spirit-led believers, they believed they, they could understand and interpret law as well as those who were trained in these areas. And therefore, um, this kind of rise to what's called biblicism, this idea that anything that did not see a warrant for in scripture they felt free to reject so everything had to be scriptural you had to support it scripturally and if it didn't uh it needed to go Uh, so in new england this saw a push for schools and universities to literate the people to teach literacy so that they understood so they could read uh to ultimately allow the citizens to say why why do we have these laws if these aren't based in scripture then they need to be uh, repealed, and we need to get new laws. So uh, it's really this push uh, for the individual to take responsibility to understand and know God's word and to hold their legislators accountable. <coughs> so come, what comes in is now uh, Sunshine focuses on Je- Jefferson in, in the de- Declaration of Independence. Uh, Jefferson echoed Locke and his insistence that the origin of human rights is found in God and not in governments. Uh, rights are unalienable because they come from God. Uh, now, what we talked about is, um, from Locke's perspective, those unalienable rights were life, liberty, and property, or a state is what he called it. But Jefferson modified those to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and I think it's important to kind of go through these so, because I think the way that we define some of these is not how Jefferson defined those. Um, life was uncontroversial because it can be traced back to God gives us life. So uh, this is an unalienable right. Um, this is not something that comes from government. Uh, this was not controversial at all throughout history. Um, this is one that doesn't, wasn't debated. Uh, liberty as an unalienable right um, had some debate about it. Uh, but from Jefferson's uh, perspective, um, He saw this as an unalienable right. Uh, From the classical definition of liberty that we saw from the Middle Ages, freedom, it's freedom to act as one wills within the bounds set by natural and divine law and the laws of the state. So uh, again, it brings in this idea that um, it's innate in all of us that God has placed an understanding of who he is in right and wrong in all of us. Um, But also... He has revealed his law to us through his word. So in the Christian tradition, the laws of the state were supposed to conform to natural law, or they were unjust. To fight back against, again, this, this 
creeping in of absolutism. There was a renewed insistence on natural and divine law as a boundary that we understood that God has brought these things about. The idea of freedom to or freedom, <clears throat> it's this idea of freedom to or for something and not from something. I think that's an important uh, concept that Jefferson understood in regards to liberty. Freedom to or for and not freedom from something. Uh, it's uh, this idea that liberty was understood to mean freedom to pursue good ends of your own choice within the bounds of natural law and divine law. With that comes a moral imperative. The ends had to be virtuous and had to come by virtuous means. Virtue was a key component of what the founding fathers understood. Uh, in fact, they said if um, really our constitution, if if we're not virtuous people, it really, it has no ability to govern us. I'm sure I just totally blitzed that, but that's the idea, that virtue was a key component of understanding um, our society and our constitution and how our government was set up. Jefferson understood this. <clears throat> Without it, people make choices based on greed, pride, self-interest, which results in the fall of the republic. So it's this idea of liberty of pursuing uh, pursuing good ends of your own choices within these bounds. It's not this freedom to do whatever you want, uh, which what Sunshine says, the alternative to virtue is license. So license in the sense that it's negative freedom. So that's this idea of freedom from restraint. So in, in this idea of license, freedom means no one can tell them what to do or tell them what they are doing is wrong. Uh, something that we can see um, very clearly in our culture today. That's what freedom means, is you can't tell me what to do or what I'm doing is wrong. And that is not how the founding fathers understood what freedom was or liberty. It's freedom to pursue good ends with virtuous means. Um, virtue is a key component of how our country was founded. Sunshine makes the point that ultimately moral and cultural relativism killed liberty. If relativism is true, then there is no natural law or divine law and no boundaries within to operate. There is no proper purpose for our freedom. Um, I think that's a huge thing. And I think as we are trying to unpack these things, and I'm quickly running out of time, um, to try to say that it's this idea that Kuiper brought in, this transformational view. We believe that God's ways are good and right, and we are to live those out so that they impact our society. Um, that's one of the reasons why we're going through these things, is to try to say that, um, give us the tools and the understanding to say what, what is happening in our culture, what is happening in our life, and what is our responsibility as, as Christians, as followers of Christ. Um, and then lastly, I want to just uh, uh, touch on this idea of happiness, because I think it's important uh, for us to understand uh, Jefferson's concept of happiness uh, because it's far from our current definition. And he understood it as an, an, an alienable right. <clears throat> um, Jefferson kind of reaching back into this idea of eudaimonia, this Greek word. Uh, it's what we saw from his writings. Uh, and it, defined, it was defined as the purpose of life, a life well lived, a good life in every sense of the word. It required the use of reason and cultivation of virtue or excellence. So again, we're, it's this focus on reason, not passion. Uh, this idea of virtue is very important in this idea of happiness. Uh, since it is the purpose of life, it is unalienable. And I, as I thought about this, you know, I thought about the purpose statement for uh, Norma Vital Church. We exist uh, to make known the glory of God for the delight and satisfaction of all peoples. Um, right? There's, there's this idea that all of life is to be lived in worship of God, whatever we do, whether we're, you know, um, whether we're doing mundane tasks, whether we're going to work, whether we're being entertained, whether we're coming to church, like, it's this idea that we are, our purpose in life is to glorify God and um, be delighted and satisfied in Him and to share that delight and satisfaction with others. Uh, Jefferson also understood eudaimonia, eudaimonia to include property. So, uh, Sunshine says he kind of uses this as, as a backdoor um, to say, hey, also what's 
what's part of this is is property. Um, kind of that same um, idea that that Locke per, per put forward in his works. Um, it's this idea that in order for us to live a life of excellence, it requires productive property, which gives the means an opportunity to pursue eudaimonia. <coughs> and I know this has probably been super tedious. Um, I just want to say a couple more things. I know that I'm like right on time, but um, I want to just briefly highlight the Constitution because it brings in this idea of um, some of these concepts that we've been talking about throughout history. Um, the Constitution was influenced by Aristotle and his three forms of government. Uh, in the monarchy, we can see this idea of the, of the President of the United States and this idea of uh, aristocracy, we can see the idea of Congress. Uh, in this idea of the Republic, we can see the House of Representatives. Um, the Constitution was also influenced by Augustine and the doctrine of original sin. So uh, they kind of disconnected themselves from Locke in that, that they did see and understood that sin was a huge part, and it was going to be um, a corrupting influence in government. And they tried to establish this uh, Constitution in such a way to uh, minimize that as much as they could. Uh, Sunshine even makes the point that um, they they kind of used uh, this idea of original original sin um, <coughs> to their advantage, right? They, they understood that each of these separate pieces of the government would want to keep their power as much as they possibly could, so they were going to fight against these other areas. And so they even established our Constitution uh, in such a way to try to battle uh, this idea of original sin. Um, I know that's a lot of history, and I know that that's a lot of stuff, and there was not a lot of time to um, ask questions. Uh, going briefly back to this, I know that we're out of time. Uh, one of the things that Truella talks about is this idea of the absolute standard of law. And hopefully going through this historical perspective, the, the, the reason why I wanted to go through that was because I think it is important to understand um, how we got to where we are. I think for me personally, it's easy to just live in my isolated, you know, chunk of the world and not really understand the significance of, of you know, godly men that, you know, you talk about Luther, you talk about Calvin, you talk about Augustine. Not that they got everything perfectly right, but these are influential men that that put themselves out and, and taught these things, understood biblical truth and impacted the way that people understood how are we to live and how does government function in these things. And ultimately, we are super blessed recipients of all of that. Um, we, yeah, I don't even know how to articulate what I'm trying to, to say, but um, there's a lot of lives that were lost uh, because of what they believed to get us to a place here where um, this is really is, to live in this country really is a gift. Um, it really is a blessing and has been the impacts and the influences of many, many hundreds of years of people and their ideas and their thoughts based in biblical truth. And I think it's important for us to understand that because uh, there is some schools of thought that kind of buy into this absolutist that uh, this is the government, this is where we're going, and we should just let it go where it's going. Um, but there's another school of thought that, you know, this is a gift. Is it possible that God will take this away because of judgment? Absolutely. And he is sovereign, and he will accomplish his plans. But we don't know that. And so should we ought not to fight for the truths that were rooted and grounded in biblical truth to, to ultimately, in a sense, to love our neighbor, right? This is going to be the best in our ability to love our neighbor and for future generations to live um, in peace and harmony. But we have a lot to fight against, right? You know, this idea of virtue is non-existent in our culture. This idea of that God has any impact or uh, there's, I mean, we've moved from relativism to the fact that anything that is godly is hatred 
uh, you know, we not only just separated, you know, this idea of uh, society rules, uh, functions outside of God, but we've moved into this place where everything godly is bad. Uh, it's this punishment of good and rewarding of evil. And so um, I know that, again, that's a lot of information. Um, it is important to understand that God's, God's word is the objective standard for law. And that is the only reason that we would have to stand against higher authorities. This is not just a, a willy-nilly resistance because you just don't like what's happening. But it is an absolutely, it's an absolute standing on the foundation of, of God's truth and standing for what is true and right. Um, and I think part of going through this is to, to help you understand that people in lesser magistrate positions need to understand this doctrine, and we as the people need to understand it so that when they do stand up, we don't just leave them hanging. We are there to support them, to say, we are behind you. Uh, we want to see the rule of law in our country upheld because we have a constitution that was founded um, in the Christian tradition, and it is a tremendous gift that we have been given. So, uh, I do apologize that there wasn't any time for comments or questions. Um, I know that's a lot of information, so if you do have questions, feel free to email me or text me, um, and we can talk about that. Maybe we can talk about that next Sunday. So I do thank you for, for your time and listening. I hope that you aren't bored to tears. Um, but I, I do encourage you. There is so much more in this book than what I was able to even talk about today, so I encourage you to, to really get it and read it. So, God, thank you for today. Uh, thank you for just a reminder that um, we live a life that's been impacted by history and generations and centuries of people that have gone before uh, that understood your word and lived their lives out in that manifestation. And God... <clears throat> gave their lives and ultimately were uh, run off and persecuted for what they believed. And God, I pray that you would help us to understand in our context, God, what it is that you're calling us to do, to stand as believers in, in this nation that you've given us. This is the time that you have put us here. And God, we want to be followers of Christ. We want to be lights to this world. And God, we need you to give us wisdom to know how to live in this time. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.